So, um, would anybody like to start us off in prayer? Mana, would you like to pray? If you're able. Ariel, if you're doing the most. I got it. Some of you. Oh, yeah. I got it. Thank you, Abiyah, for giving us this Shabbat, Father. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for giving us breath in our bodies. Thank you also, Father, for keeping our households, Father, and keeping all your promises, Father, to keep us safe throughout all the things that we have been going through uh, within our families, our financial, um, with the weather. Uh, I pray for the people in Florida, Father, that the people that are yours, Father, that you blanket them, keep, keep them shielded, Father, from the storm and from the pestilence, Father. I also pray that anyone is, that is leaving from there, Father, that you blanket them and keep them wherever they are going. I also pray, Father, that you bless our houses, bless our children, Father. Um, also, Father, I pray that as we read the Torah today, that we take everything to heart and make the changes in our home, Father, and not just read it and not just be here to just to see it, Father, but just to hear it, take it, and also um, to act upon it, Father. Also pray, Father, that you give us the spirit of boldness. You also give us um, the spirit of uh, correction, the spirit of love, um, and also the spirit of grace and mercy, Father, that we may act in all those things, Father, as being a light unto the world, Father, as you call us to be. In Yahushua HaMashiach name, I pray. Hallelujah. 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 I'll give me one second. Hallelujah. Well said. Give me one second. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Makoti. Shabbat Shalom. All right, shalom, shalom. I had to get the humidifier together. It was getting stuffy already, my fault. 
<sighs> so today, if we get to a read, oh, excuse me. I think this Tuesday when we do the Book of Jasher going to be a really good read. I haven't. Oh. Really do that? I have been reading through it. It was a lot of, um, there was a lot of good information in it. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Uh, so, I'm going to just do some reading today. Y'all just walk, walk, follow me. Shelly even got a word for y'all, man. Ain't that something? She did something for y'all this week. Hallelujah. <laughs> What I'm reading from right here is the book of Enoch. And as you see, the title of it is The Fall of the Angels. Uh, anybody just let me know if they can't see it. And it says, this is the book of Enoch, chapter six. It says, in those days when the children of man had multiplied, it happened that there were born unto them handsome and beautiful daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, come let us choose wives for ourselves from among the daughters of man and beget us children. And Semyaz, being their leader, said unto them, I fear that perhaps you will not consent that this deed should be done and I alone will become responsible for this great sin. But they all responded to him, let us all swear an oath and bind everyone among us by a curse, not to abandon this suggestion, but to do the deed. Then they all swore together and bound one another by the curse. And they were all together 200. And they descended into Ardos, which is at the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called the Mount Armand. For they swore and bound one another by a curse. And their names are as follows. Semyaz, the leader of Arkid, Ramiel, Tamiel, Ramel, Daniel, Ezekiel, Barakael, Asel, Armoros, Batriel, Ananel, Zakiel, Sasomask, Sasomaspiel, Kestarel, Kestarel, Turel, Yamayo, Arazayal. These are their chiefs of tens and of all the others of them. And mind you, this is not every angel that fell from heaven, but it was a certain group of these angels that fell from heaven that said, we're going to take wives and have children. And we know those children to go on to be the giants. Excuse me. So next, <clears throat> as we read further in chapter seven, and this is why we, when we talk about um, when you hear somebody use the word devil or Satan, those are just um, how can I put it? Those are just uh, titles. The oppressor or the adversary, the enemy. They are. It is not necessarily a fallen angel's name. So when you hear the word devil or even demons, it's a plurality in that. Um, that's why the scripture says we fight powers, principalities, and strongholds of darkness. It's more than just one entity. There are a multitude of entities that work towards the evil of this world. Um, and it's just kind of describing that like these ain't every one of the angels, but it was these certain, this certain 200, and this was the leader of the tens of them. So each one of these angels had 10 angels under him. Um, that said that they were going to take women and have these children, but that that is not all of the fallen angels. Chapter seven say, and they took wives unto themselves and everyone respectively chose one woman for himself. 
and they began to go unto them and they taught them magical medicine. This is key. And they taught them magical medicine, incantation, which is magic spells and things of that nature. The cutting of roots. Which, mind you, these people, remember, these are the people descended from Adam, Seth, and Cain. They are already tilling the ground and, and uh, they are already farmers, quote unquote, so to speak. So, and we know that from Adam and Cain or Abel and Cain when they offer, uh, offered the sacrifices to Yah. Cain offered, uh, you know, like some fruits and some things from the field that he grew. So they already know how to do that. So this cutting of roots, it's a very good chance that this cutting of roots is the roots of the family, a.k.a. they taught them abortion right here. It says, and they taught them about plants, because you see, then it goes on to speak about plants. But we know Cain already knew about plants. He was already growing. Adam was growing as they were commanded to till the ground. So what exactly did they teach them? And the women became pregnant and gave birth to great giants whose heights were 300 cubits, which is 450 feet. These were some really big giants. These giants consumed the produce of all the people until the people detested feeding them. So the giants turned against the people in order to eat them. And they began to sin against birds, wild beasts, reptiles, and fish. And their flesh was devoured the one by the other. And they drained blood. So the giants, once the people stopped giving them all the produce, they started eating people. They began to sin against the birds, the wild beasts, the reptiles, and the fish. And their flesh was devoured one by another. They started warring with the giants, the war of the giants, as some people call it. They started to fight against each other and kill and eat each other. And they drank blood. And then the earth brought an accusation against the oppressors. The earth prayed <laughs> and told Yah, these giants down here tripping. Chapter 8. And Azazel. Now, mind you, he was not just named as one of the angels that had the children. And Azazel taught the people the art of making swords and knives and shields. So first he taught them the art of war. Because that's what swords and knives and shields do. We use them to go to war. And breastplates. No, I ain't gonna fire now. And breastplate. So he taught them the art of war. And he showed to their chosen ones bracelets, decorations, shadowing of the eye. With a time with 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 a ten money. I want to say autonomy, but I don't know if that's the right word. But anyway, well, let me look it up real quick. How do I pronounce that? Antimony. Antimony, maybe? It says it's the chemical element of atomic number 51. Was anti Antimony was known from ancient times the naturally occurring black sulfide was used as the cosmetic coal. The element is used in alloys, usually the lead, usually with lead, such as pewter, type metal, and Britannia metal. So it was kind of like a black sulfide or coal type of things which you see kind of reminds me of when you watch football people always had a little black strips under their eyes that's what i envision right here i could be wrong but this certain angel azazel he taught them that he taught them ornamentation he taught them the beautifying of the eyelids which is kind of like the makeup i'm assuming with the women he taught them about all kinds of precious stones and all the coloring tinctures and alchemy and there were many wicked ones and they committed adultery and erred and all their conduct became corrupt. Amasras taught incantation and the cutting of roots. Once again, this is a good chance that this is abortion. And Amaras, Amaros, the resolving of incantations or magic spirits, um, 
you know, people used to say that back in the day when somebody was doing something wicked or put a, a wicked spell on you, they say somebody will put a rune on you. <laughs> and Baraka, y'all, he taught astrology. And Kokar, R.L., the knowledge of the signs. He's talking about the zodiac. And Tamiel taught the scene of the stars. And Asdurel taught the course of the moon as well as the deception of man. And the people cried and their voice reached unto heaven. So as I read that, I'm just reading that to show that. Now, mind you, all this stuff that they teach it, y'all's like, y'all taught wickedness. So it's not just about seeing the stars and the moon or the signs. Because remember, well, if you haven't read this, Enoch taught all of that already. Enoch already taught and when Enoch taught it, he said, this is what y'all showed me. This is how the moon move. This is the, 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 the order of the stars. These are the signs. Enoch already taught that. So they're teaching their own version of that. And Yah's like, yeah, it does remind me of like a war paint. Exactly. That's a better way to put it. But Yah's like, that's wickedness. I didn't tell. I, that's not how that was supposed to be taught. I taught Enoch how that was supposed to be taught. They've chosen to teach you that how they feel. Jumping down to verse 13. And that's a thing that go on now. You know, Yah's taught us a way. And then you have some men who want to teach the, what they call the truth of the word of Yah, how they feel. And that's the same thing these fallen angels was. We're going to teach this how we feel. And in this case, Yah's like, nah, that's not how I told you to do that, though. That's not how that was supposed to be taught. I taught Enoch how that was supposed to be taught. Verse 13, or chapter 13, skipping down. As for Enoch, he proceeded and said to Azazel, there will not be peace unto you. A grave judgment has come upon you. Remember, Azazel was not one of the ones named to add made it with the women yet Enoch is telling them and, and Enoch speaking from what Yah just told him you can't have peace it's a great judgment has come upon you they will put you in bonds and you will not have an opportunity for rest and supplication because you have taught injustice and because you have shown to the people deeds of shame injustice and sin so the sin is, is putting a face with it because we understand that Yah created Adam and Eve perfect. The serpent in the garden with the tree of knowledge and good and evil caused them to sin and fall from the garden. And now they're, you know, um, in sin. And Yah's putting a face to it was more than one, like I say, because we always just talk about we're taught the devil, Satan or Lucifer. And we see that there was a collection of angels working to this end or fallen angels. And Yah said that what they taught was shame, injustice, and sin. They have taught injustice, right? You have been put in bonds. So the things that they were teaching, Yah wasn't with. He was like, no, nah, that's not it. And this is going to make sense as we move forward. I just wanted to read that to start off. This is any questions or comments about this Enoch to start off. Anybody got anything they want to add to that? No, I didn't have any questions. I was just kind of intrigued because I was wondering, you know, when you went here, because I talked to my husband about this this morning, about the falling. We was talking about it back and forth this morning. Thought it was really odd that you went here, but no. I'm happy that you went here because it explains the sin. This is, this is, this is, this is, <clears throat> and more than likely in the garden, when they took from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, they were taught some of these things. And y'all was like, nah, that ain't how that's supposed to go. And this is, these are the things that the devil was like, you'll be like God's and knowing good, right from wrong. <sighs> these different things. But, Azazel and these angels were teaching me in things that Yah said was not how it was supposed to go. Shame, 
injustice and sin. Hallelujah. We're just going to start. That's just a start. But that's going to come back up. I just wanted to read that. Um, Leviticus 16. So Tuesday, October 4th at sundown till Wednesday, October 5th is the Day of Atonement. And as you know, we've spoke on this in here before. It's a day of fasting. Um, no food, no water, or, you know, some people have health issues and different things you may not be able to do. Maybe no water, no food for a whole day, maybe half a day, or maybe just water, or um, maybe fast from doing things that you would typically do. Maybe fast from social media and TV. Um, it's a multitude of ways that you can get this done. But we just, me personally, I'm going to do no food, no water for that day from sundown to sundown. And we spoke about it as far as afflicting the soul, which Shelly is going to speak to afflicting the soul in a minute. Um, it's about humbling yourself, a day of prayer, repentance, meditation. Um, you know, it's, it's about showing that we have control over our physical being and that we will um, continue to fulfill the things that Yah's calling us to do and be, right? So as we humble our bodies, we focus on the spiritual, which is what the scripture is telling us to focus on the spiritual matters. Um, and then humbling our physical, like I say, it makes our spiritual stronger, you know? Um, and it's a way, and in this day, Yah is calling us to do as a reconciliation for sin. So in Leviticus 16, today we're going to read how they did it in the wilderness, leaving Egypt when it first started. And we're going to draw some correlations with some things to exactly, um, you know, Yah willing, as we always pray that we're two or more got the Ruach HaKodesh is amongst us, that Yah will show us exactly why other than just atoning for sin, um, which we're, 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 we're building up into a day to where we won't be in sin. You know, we won't, our lives, we will be focused completely on the spiritual and sin won't be a burden for us as it has been in our lives as we learn and give more to Yah. And, and that's kind of what it is. As you learn to give more to Yah, it'll draw you farther away from sin because the more you focus on Yah, um, the harder it is to sin when we focus on our Elohim. And it's a process. I was just telling my brother and my guy last night we were talking. It's a process to build to that. Um, so don't get discouraged. But we are building towards the perfection. That's what we talk when we talk about building towards the perfection is one day being able to wake up and say, you know what, I have not sinned in days, weeks, months, years. Hallelujah. So we're going to read about the initial day of atonement and, and how it started and see if we could draw some correlation of to um, just some correlation into today and exactly why. Um, like I say, y'all willing, if he see fit for us to see that, but why exactly is he calling us to do this? Because there is a point to be made here. And remember what we just read in Enoch, that's going to come back up and it'll make sense to you when it comes. It may not completely make sense now, but it's going to make sense to you when it comes back up. When it when it comes back up. So Leviticus chapter sixteen, verse one and two. We're going to take this. We're going to take this pretty slow because it's a lot of information. Uh, and if anybody got any questions or comments as we move forward, just let me know. Leviticus chapter sixteen, verse one and two. It says. And Yahuwah, and Yahuwah, you know, Yahuwah, where they put the Lord at most of the time in this book is Yehovah, they say here, but in Hebrew, the Va could be a Wa sound. So Yahuwah or Yahuwah, and it means the self existent or eternal. Hallelujah. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, who was Moshe, after the death of the two sons of Aharon, which is Moses' brother Aaron, when they offered before Yah and died. So a little backstory. 
Yah has called Moses to be the head, the high priest, the chief priest, and he's a Levite. This one you hear people talk about Levitical priests. It started with Aaron. He's the first Levitical high priest Yah chose in the wilderness. They're, they've just left, left Egypt. All this is taking place. And he had two sons that really just didn't want to get with the program. The high priest is the one that's supposed to go in with, a, with the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy CD is. He makes the offerings and puts the blood on the altar and does all those things. Now, all of the priests have a job, but the high priest is the one who goes into. Mahak Yahushua was speaking about this earlier. The high priest is the one who goes into the um, holy of holy and does the business of Yah. I see you just got in here, Yahushua. You want to explain that a little bit further for me? Because I know you just did an extensive reading about this job earlier. Yeah, sh Shabbat Shalom, Ma. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, Shabbat Shalom to everybody on the call. Um, yeah, just like we were talking about earlier, the the uh, high priest, he is the only one who's sanctified to go in in the seventh month on the tenth day to reconcile Israel back to the Father for any of their sins, any of their transgressions. And like in this uh, chapter here, you know, he has to make a sacrifice of a bullock for himself and his family before he can even begin the job of offering the blood of the goat, which is done on behalf of Israel, which is shed upon the, the mercy seat, which is upon the Ark of the Covenant. Um, before that blood is even placed on there, they have to, uh, uh, certain incense has to be placed upon the mercy seat, and then the blood is put on there, and then they have to sanctify the altar afterwards. So it's a, it's a long process, but I, I just was going to give you that. Like, I know you're going you to break it down more than that, but I just want to give you that little, that little bit. Well, hallelujah. Told out, told out. Thank you. So as, as the Yogger said, he had to be Aaron is the first high priest. Now we know that in the end, the Messiah is the high priest. Keep that in mind because we're going to see if we could draw a correlation to what's going on here. But as the Yogger said, Aaron had to be set apart, sanctified, anointed with oil and all of that. And now his sons, which are the Levitical priests, they all have jobs. Um, all people from the line of Levi, I should say, which is one of Jacob's sons, which is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, some's job is to take down the tabernacle as they're moving it into tent through the wilderness at the time. Some of their job is to carry the Ark of the Covenant on the two um, sticks, or they may even make golden sticks that sit within these rings that you lifted up. Nobody physically touched the Ark of the Covenant. Um, some of them were to uh, do these sacrifices with their father. Um, all of the Levitical priesthood had a job, but the high priest, like the ox said, is the one who is anointed to go into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And basically, he speaks on behalf of the people to Yah. He makes atonement for them. Um, he prays for them. He carries these incense and all these things in, as he said. And we're going to see, we're going to, we're going to dig into some words and just play, play on that and see what all that means. Um, but he is the one. And he's the first high priest, at least of the Levitical priesthood. But we know that the high priest of all of Israel today is the Messiah. So Moses, after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before Yah and died, his sons didn't want to be part of the program. They felt like if our father and our brothers got these different jobs and, you know, I'm paraphrasing because I'm not reading the story exactly right off hand, but they went behind their father's back. And they went in like they was finna go offer and do the things that the high priest was called. And Yah sent the fire from the throne, which is the Ark of the Covenant, and it burnt them up within the temple. And the fire was so precise. If you go back and read the story, it's in Leviticus. I think it's like chapter 14, 10, chapter 10. It's, it's somewhere right around or chapter 9. Um, somebody can put it in the chat exactly what a chapter story is. is their, their name was Nadab in the bayou. And the fire, when it came from the Ark of the Covenant, it burnt them. It didn't burn their clothes. It only burnt their flesh. And we know that because when they tell the people to go in there and get them out, they carried them out by their clothes. And it was considered strange fire because they weren't supposed to make that offering. This is exactly right. But we're going to we're going to bring that up. As you see right here, it says when they offer before Yah and the word here for offer. The word here for offered. 
It tells us a bringing. Excuse me. The word here for offered is karab. It says to approach for whatever purpose, to bring near, to present or produce, to make ready. So they brought us, it says that they presented a strange fire to Yah. But, and just to bring a correlation to that, um, and I know some of y'all on the call, we've talked about this before. It was Leviticus 10, okay. That up until Yah woke us up to the truth of who we were and brought us back into the understanding of him, um, we were presenting strange fire because we were presenting what we were taught as tradition to be what was right and it wasn't necessarily right and our people like i say a lot of our people have just been ignorant to this because we've been passing traditions down instead of looking into them but whatever they presented was not what yah commanded and how it be presented and we were doing the same up until yah gave us the truth about his word and showed us our own actions and now we present a acceptable fire if that makes sense. Now, that's a correlation I'm drawing. They actually took a fire. <laughs> and back then in the tabernacle, the first fire that lit whatever in the tabernacle, and I because I'm just I'm drawing a blank on exactly what it lit. Was it the incense or the altar, or maybe it just been an offering? They said that a fire came from Yah from heaven and burnt up, it lit this offering, I believe. So then they took like a fire from the fire they kindled off in the camp in there, and Yah was like, no, nah, that ain't. That's not the fire I sent. And like I say, it burnt them up in their clothes. It burnt them up. It burnt them up in their clothes. But their clothes was okay. And the reason why the clothes was okay, because they had been given those clothes and anointed in those clothes to do the work of Yah. So the clothes and the work and the clothes had the anointing oil. They were doing the work of Yah. But the men wearing them wasn't. And Yah showed that by only burning the people who were wearing the clothes up. Verse two, it says, and like I said, if there's any questions or comments with any of this, because this is going to be kind of, um, this is going to be different. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, the holy of holy, within the veil, before the mercy seat. So he like, even the high priest, don't just be willy nilly in here. Even the high priest, you the one commanded to come in here at certain times. And this may be the only time too. Are you right? I, the day of atonement may be the only time I can really think of where he go in there. But y'all tell him, he's telling the high priest who's given that authority, don't just be in here all the time. Don't come in here at all times. He says, which is up on the ark. Where the mercy seat is, which is on the ark. Where the ark of the covenant and all of that, the holy of holy of the temple. Don't be in here that you die not. For I will appear in a cloud up on the mercy seat. And if you ain't here when I appear, which the cloud is representing the Ruach HaKodesh or the spirit of Yah, you're going to die. So don't just be in here. So when we look at the word here for Excuse me. When we look at the word here for. The veil. And we know at the death of the Messiah, it said that the veil was ripped and it was symbolizing that the Levitical priesthood had fallen. So the veil is a separatist, a separate tricks that is sacred, a screen and. A correlation of the veil is we know that the scriptures say flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of Yah. Why? Because flesh and blood can't stand before the cloud or the spirit or the glory of Yah, right? And the veil in the Holy of Holies, because remember, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant is the earthly representation of the throne of Yah. And that's why he said, on the cloud, I'm going to come up on the mercy seat, because that's Yah showing. And the Shemaim, I sit on the throne. So when I come down to earth to deal with y'all and just my presence on the cloud, which which we know to be Hamashiach, he sent here to come upon this throne because Yah can't. Flesh and blood can't stand in front of Yah because it's corruptible in its nature. 
and anything corruptible that stands in front of the Most High himself, his pure spirit will kill it, if that make any sense. So the Mark of the Covenant and the mercy seat which sits on it is representing the throne room of Yah in heaven. And it sits within this veil in the tabernacle in the holiest place in there, the Holy of Holies. And the correlation here, as I say, we're going to draw some correlation today is the firmament. So we know in the sky that there's a firmament that separates heaven from earth. How far that is off of the earth in the sky, who knows? I don't know. But it's there. And the fallen angels can sit in the firmament. I don't believe man has ever gotten to the firmament, let alone can sit in it or go in it. But the firmament is a veil between earth and heaven. It separates earth and heaven. Why? Because when you get into um, the levels of heaven, at the top is the throne of Yah. And man can't get through the, the firmament the same way he's telling Aaron, don't just be coming in this veil because that's where my presence is. And if you are in here and I have not called you or given you the command to do that, then you gonna die. And this is probably why so many men, when they be trying to go up to this firmament and play up in the sky, they done die because that's we man has not been called. You know, that's the devil telling man, make your way through this firmament. You can go into heaven too. It's the same spiel from the garden. You can be like gods too. That's what these space programs is. Is the devil done told these men or the adversary, right? Some section of these fallen angels, because there is no necessary devil. It's a multitude of wickedness that runs this world. Now, I do believe it's a leader over it, but we always have to remember it's not just one who does this. And he has gave me and taught me in this technology as we seen in Enoch. He didn't taught me in these things like you can go to the firmament, you can go through it. You can be like God. That's what he told Eve in the garden. You could be like God. He don't he don't want me to teach you this because he know you will be like us, which ain't no us. <laughs> the devil ain't like y'all. But he told Eve that. And that's the same thing they do in the day, trying to get through the firmament to be like our Elohim. So the veil can be seen as like the firmament. And he's telling the high priest who does have the authority to go in there, but don't just be in here any old which way. Only come when called and on the times appointed. Other than that, even as high priest, you will die for your disobedience. Verse three, it says, thus shall Aharon come into the holy place, the holy of holies, the throne, the rep, the holy place is representing the throne room of Yah. Keep that in mind. With the young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So Aaron, he has to come. When he does, he got to bring a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put on the holy linen coat. And she held, and, and now these are the garments of the high priest. You didn't wear them every day. Only when you went in here, you had to have only certain garments that were anointed by Yah to go into the throne room of Yah. And he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be guarded with a linen girdle and with the linen mitri, which the mitri represents like a crown. It's a turban. As you say, a tiara. It's mitznefeth, a tiara that is official turban of a king or high priest, a diadem, is representing a crown. Shall he be attired? These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. So we see he's telling Aaron, he's telling Aaron, you got to go in. You got to come in here with a young bullock for sin offering for yourself. This first offering is for yourself. But for you even clean enough yourself to come in here after I done told you, you have to sacrifice a bullock for your sins and a ram for a burnt offering. A burnt offering represents what they call an ascending offering. As we see here, the burnt offering is Ola, a step or a step or collective collectively stairs as ascending as ascending 
ascent, go up. So first and foremost, he like, now Aaron is representing righteous Israel. Aaron is playing the role of our Messiah, the high priest at this time. But you got to sacrifice this young bullock, he said. Because the young bullock, the young bullock, the word is par. It represents wild strength or perhaps the dividing of the hoof. The young bull. It also could be an oxen or a calf. And we know that the first letter in Hebrew, which is the first letter in Hebrew, which is the Aleph, is represented by an oxen, representing strength or power, leader. As we see that the word for bullock here, par, is pay, which is this circle representing the mouth. That's the letter pay in Hebrew. And is the head of man is the resh. The, with the mouth we speak or it could represent the word so the word for bullock in the ancient hebrew is the word of man or this head can mean the the air or the sun so the word of the air or the sun so this young bullock is representing the messiah who was the sin offering for the world and then the ram the ascending offering the ram, the word is I yield, hence strength, a chief, uh, a strong support. And then it says an oak or other strong tree, mighty man, lentil, post, ram, tree. So the ram, the ascending offering is the, my, the bullock, the, the Messiah who died for our sins, the young bullock. But his spirit, the strength of man, which is our spirit, the best parts of man, which is our spirit, his ruach, it ascended back into the heavens to Yah. It says that Aaron has to put on all these linen, the holy garments that Yah has anointed and given him to go into the throne room, right? But he has to wash his flesh in water. And we didn't been through this with the baptism. There is a baptism of water, but the true baptism is to be washed and cleaned in the word. We clean our actions up by learning the word and applying the word to our lives. And we have to do that before we can put on the holy garments to go into the throne room of Yah. Any questions or comments on these first four verses before we move on? Is everybody good? Go ahead, Yahakim. It's, well, I'm not sure if, uh, shalom everybody. I'm not sure if it's a question or if it's a comment or it's sort of a comment. You know, it made me think about when we read Enoch before about uh, that portion where he got to talking about the bovids, that first line being bovids. And then yes. later on, it was rams. And we were, we kept trying to, when it was talking about uh how Sarah cried over her, or was it Sarai? I can't remember, but the in the vision, the woman was crying over the bovids, the two bovids, and the no, one that got slain. That was Eve. That whole thing. Abel. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So it made me think, my mind immediately went there to those when you were break, doing the breakdown. And I was thinking about the bovids and the ram. So then that just brought even more light to that that little analogy so i just that's where my mind went with it so kind of oh, wasn't a question sort of a comment but no, just your thoughts on that i told you that makes sense that in enoch yah compares adam now to bovids which are like big oxen or cattle and as we've seen the word bullock can also mean cattle or oxen representing the strength the first the leader as we know, the oxen, when you plow the field in ancient times, the oxen would lead, you would have a lead oxen and the rest of them would be hooked up to it and it would pull you on, on the, the chariot, for lack of a better word, with the, the plow. And that's how you would sow the seed, especially in a big field. Um, but you would always have that, that first oxen and Adam was a first bovid, but we know that the Messiah is the first of all creation. So you will hear people say, I once heard this. Um, you'll hear 
sometimes in scripture to say that the Messiah is the firstborn of all things. Adam is the firstborn, is a firstborn. And they even talk about um, Jacob being a firstborn. And some people would be like, well, how can they all be the firstborn? It's because Yah is, is, is differentiating different things. Yaakov, whose name was changed to Israel, he's the firstborn of nations. Why? Because Israel is the first time Yah ever chose a specific nation as his chosen people. Before then, it wasn't about nation. It was about, um, it was being passed as a bloodline. But even before then, with Noah going back to Adam, it was everybody. Everybody had right to um, the experience of Yah, I'm going to say, for lack of a better word. So when it calls Israel the firstborn, and I'm not sure exactly what the scripture is, but I know it's one in there that, that says Jacob or Israel is my firstborn. He's saying, you're the firstborn of nations that I chose to me. When it calls Adam the firstborn, Yah is saying, Adam is the firstborn of the creation of man, period. All mankind, Adam is the firstborn. But then when it says that Hamashiach is the firstborn, he's saying that Yahushua is the firstborn of all creation. No matter what it is, whether it be man, principalities, the earth, mountains, the heavens. I created him before it all. But they all would represent, and I think it might have represented Jacob and that with a ram, but being the firstborn, the leader, Hamashiach and Adam, those bovids you speak about in Enoch, they would represent the oxen, the bullock, the strength, the head of the cattle, the leader. Um, if that make any sense. But in verse four, as you see, um, what's his name? Aaron, Aharon, the first high priest of the Levitical order, he had to be washed before he could put on the holy garments from Yah to go into the throne room of Yah. And that's representing us being washed in the word, learning the ways of the word, and changing our ways from the world and the flesh and how we done live to put on in the end, hopefully, if we be found worthy, Abba Yah, the holy garments of Yah to go back into the throne room of Yah. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And I had a precept for this. I had wrote down some precepts for all of this. Let's make sure we get this right. I don't want to rush through nothing. It's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. And it says, it says, for the Messiah also have once suffered for sins. He was just and he gave his life for the unjust is what he's saying. Here. That he might bring us to the Most High Yah, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. See, that's the bullock put to death in the flesh. And the ram is representing the quickening of the spirit, the ascending offering. Verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. We know that when Hamashiach died, he said, I'm going to be in the earth for three days and three nights. He went down to hell. He freed them. He took the keys to hell, broke the gates. We've been through that. Um, all of you may not have been with us when we went through that. It was a while ago, but we went through that. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of Elohim waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by the water. We just read this in Jasser. Yah had Noah and Methuselah preaching for 120 years. If we we got to repent to the whole world. We got to repent. Yah say he going to destroy the world. If we don't turn from this and the man was like, Psh, we don't want to hear that. But then when it started flooding, they was like, Psh, Noah, let us in. And that's the next chapter. That's what we on next Tuesday in Jasher. And Noah like, nah, y'all told you what to do. You don't want to do that. It's too late. Which lets us know that Yah is merciful and you have time. But there is a time when Yah will cut off prayer. There is no more repentance. And that's why we have to take today serious with what he's doing with us in the word. So he's saying that the Messiah went to a, went down to the prison to some people who at a time were disobedient. Adam was disobedient at a time. Many people done been disobedient at the time, but they could still be forgiven. 
Let that be encouragement to you that even though we may slack sometimes, if we pray, we repent, we humble ourselves, which is what atonement is about. And we have to change ourselves too, though. You can't just say, I'm through stealing. Repent, I'm through stealing. Forgive me and still be stealing. That's not how it works. You have to forgive me for stealing and then you have to try your hardest to never steal nothing else. That's true repentance. First Peter chapter three, verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism do have also now save us. Not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh. And see, that's why the baptism ain't just about ducking in no water. Because water, when you do that, only clean your flesh. But the answer of a good conscience towards Elohim by the resurrection of Yahushua HaMashiach. So he's telling us like, yeah, he's talking about that ram. The true baptism is about applying the word to your life. Changing your conscience towards Yah. How do you do that? You have to learn what Yah says is good or tobe, as we went through last week. Functional. How do you do that? We got to read our Bible. He's given He's given us, remember, my wife did Torah as a word. It represents instruction. And the Bible, in its totality, is the instruction from Yah. And it's done by the resurrection of Yahushua, the ram, the ascending offering, the quickening of the spirit. Who is going into heaven, the ram ascending, is on the right hand of Elohim. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him because he's the firstborn of all creation. And if you all want to, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 47 through 54, it talks about... Um, Yahoshua upon his return, changing our garments and making heavenly garments. And we've read that in here before. Changing us to make these heavenly garments so that we um can be presented into the throne room of Yah, if you all want to go back and read more into that. But we broke that down in here before. So as we see, we have to wash our, our flesh. Now, Aaron was washing his flesh in water, but we have to be renewed in that consciousness, renewed in the word, applying it to our lives in the hopes that in the end, Abba Yah will put the holy garments on us and we can come back into the throne. Because remember, Nadab and Abayu got their skin burned up, but the garments was the same because the garments were given by Yah. So you can't just get garments, holy garments. Yah has to give you holy garments and he does that by, uh, by us being obedient. Now, grace will come unto us. Even in sin, he'll show us the way. That's grace. He will allow us the opportunity to see the house, to get into the house for a second. That's grace. But we have to learn the rules of the house to stay in the house. And that's how you get the Holy God. Hallelujah. Leviticus 16, verse 5. So that's what Aaron had to do all of that for himself, as the ox, as my ox said, to start this off. Just to go into the throne room of Yah, to do the work of the people. It says, and he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel, Leviticus 16, 5, two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So for the children of Israel, now after he did this bullock and all this stuff for himself, he had to take two kids of the goats, two goats for sin offering for the congregation, for the people, and one ram for a burnt offering. Once again, that spirit ascending, the best part of it, the strength of a man, right? Verse 16. Let me see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure I'm on point. I actually had to write a lot of notes for this. <laughs> and Aharon, the high priest Aaron, shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. As we said, that bullock he had to offer for himself to make atonement. We know that he did that. This is what Aaron had to do to go into the Holy of Holies. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we see something. We see y'all do the same thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, And all things are of Elohim, all things, who have reconciled us to himself 
who have reconciled us to himself by Yahushua HaMashiach, our Messiah, and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation, meaning you can make it back. That's reconciliation. I know you in sin, but I'm making a way for you to make it back into the house of Yah. Hamashiach died to reconcile us back to Yah, to reestablish a connection that was severed. Verse 19, to wit that Elohim was in my, the Messiah. So Yah was in the Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, forgiving them of their sins, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors. This is us today, representative, senior. We are the representatives of Hamashiach as though Elohim did beseech you by us. We pray you in, in the Messiah's steed, be ye reconciled to Yah. When we come into this truth and we say that we walking by the word of Yah, we some awakened Israelite, we are a representation of the Messiah as he was a representation of Yah on this planet. And we have to take that serious. Verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He was unblemished. He never sinned. That we might be made the righteous of Elohim and him. I highlight the word reconciled there because as we see, and Aharon shall offer his bullock of a sin offering, Leviticus 16, 6, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself. I should add that highlight. So Aaron had to do that to make atonement for himself. Yah did it to reconcile us back to himself. But the word here for atonement means kafar. And it means to reconcile. Aaron had to reconcile his own sins of himself and his household so that he could be worthy to go into the house of Yah. Yah sent, because Yah does not sin, but Yah sent his beloved, which is his son, into the world to die. To reconcile us back to him. Do you all see the correlation there that we draw? This is kind of where we going with this. Um, yeah, I'm with you are. Hallelujah. So we see this day of atonement is bigger than just, you know, um, it'll make sense more as we go. But Aaron is playing a role. Yah is using Aaron the priesthood and all that to show, and my ox said this earlier, it's all a shadow of things to come. Mind you, at this time, this is roughly 1,500 years before the birth of the Messiah. So this was a shadow of things to come even for them. So now we 2,000 years from that, 3,500 years possibly from this, we're looking back on it, but it's always still a shadow of things to come. Aaron had to make he had to offer the bullock, which is for himself. So Yah offered Hamashiach for what? For himself to reconcile us back. Why? Because I gave my word to Abraham that I would go get a remnant. And they all in sin. At this point, I don't got a remnant of them to go get. <laughs> so I'm going to send the Messiah. Yah said, I'm going to make atonement for myself. I'm going to reconcile them back. I'm going to send Hamashiach to die to assure that that word don't go out void, that there will in the end be a remnant who get this right and can come back into my house. As it says, Aaron had to make atonement for himself and for his house. Yah, like I sent the Messiah to reconcile you back to make it into my house. Hallelujah. Leviticus 16, 7. Now he's talking about the two goats and all of that for the people. And he shall take the two goats and present them before Yah at the door of the tabernacle. So he ain't even going in with the goats. He just presenting them to Yah outside of the tabernacle. And the Holy of Holies is deep within the tabernacle. He ain't even going in with the goats. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. One lot for Yah and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aharon shall bring the goat upon which Yahuwah's lot fell. 
So he's going to choose. One goat going to be for Yah, and one of them going to be the scapegoat. And the one that's for Yah, he's going to offer him for a sin offering. Huh. But the goat on which the lot failed to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yah to make atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So now, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 7. First off, what's a goat? What is a goat? Sayer, Sayer, maybe is how they would say that. It says Shaggy, Ego, Fawn, Devil. This is why we don't call people the goats. Think about that, man. We live in a world that everybody is the goat of something, which they use it as an acronym or whatnot, greatest of all time. Um, you know, Michael Jordan is the goat. Michael Jackson is the goat. Beyonce is the goat. Some people may tell you Madonna was the goat. Tom Brady is the GOAT. Taylor Swift is the GOAT. <laughs> uh, it's all kind of GOAT. Soccer players is the GOAT. Baseball Babe Ruth was the GOAT. In the Bible, the GOAT is the devil. <laughs> we ain't calling nobody the GOAT. And I see that on these sports shows every day. Uh, it always made me think of that because when you watch the sports shows in the morning, if you were to catch them, the entire show be talking about who the GOAT of what. And every time they say it, I think like, man, in the Bible, the devil is the goat. You just call the people the devil, really, when you're calling them the goat. But a goat represents, let me see here. No, no, is that the right word for goat there? What is it? No, it's the goat. Oh, no, no, I think it's a scapegoat. It's a scapegoat. Let me see. Let me make sure. That's Thirty-one sixty-three. Yeah. Okay. The gold represents the devil. The gold also represents pride. I'm gonna find it as we go. It tells us that somewhere in here. But it says that it was two lots for the gold. One gold was for Yah, and one gold was the scapegoat. The gold for Yah that's being sacrificed as the as the sin offering is representing men. What is it representing? It's representing men who have been in sin, but they didn't repent it. They didn't made atonement. They didn't humble themselves. And then they're offering their self as the sin offering. I'm not going to do that no more. I'm going to do better. I'm going to move different. That's the one go for Yah. As you see, he said two lots, one lot for Yah and the other is the scapegoat. And Yahuwah's lot is an offer for him for sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell. I think I'm gonna find a lot here. Yes. The goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented a lot. And as you see, lot, just a defined lot here. It says to be rough a stone, a pebble that is a lot, small stones, portion or destiny. And they would use these stones, and I think they would be color stones, it's going to say in another part of this. Um, yeah, right here. Colored stones are used to cast lots to determine the course. I'm not sure exactly how they would use these stones to, um, to determine the course of action or make a decision, but it would be some colored stones, it says there. And you, you hear in the Bible, them talk about casting lots a lot. They would make decisions with these lots. How exactly they do that, it's, it, it's beyond me. But the goat on which the lot failed to be the scapegoat shall be presented a lot to make atonement with him. And the word for atonement here is the same word, but we know that Yah ain't using it. Well, I guess I could have did that. It's the same word. But we also see that it can mean to purge away or to put off. We're going to focus on purge away with this scapegoat, and we'll see why in a minute. So he casts lots to make an atonement or to purge away with him because he's going to let him go into, to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And the, the word for wilderness here means midbar, a desert. It could mean a drive in a pasture. By implication, 
a desert. It's going to let them go into the desert, a barren place. Why? Because the scapegoat is Azazel, the goat of departure. And the reason why I read that about Enoch earlier is because the angel who taught all this sin to the world was Azazel. And as we go down in this, you're going to see that the scapegoat, before they would let it go into the wilderness, Aaron would put his hands on it and he would pray all the sins of the people into this scapegoat and they would let it go into a barren place. And you'll understand better what this barren place is as we move forward. But he's praying all the sins of the people into this goat that Yah is going to let this going to purge away into this barren place is what the Hebraic understanding would be. Um, being let go is not a blessing. The other one's dying for a sin offering, but the offering is being made to go up to Yah. Being purged or sent away alive is not a blessing for the goat. It's actually more of a curse. Hallelujah, Shelly. But it's actually more of a curse. Why? Because Azazel taught this world sin. So Yah is going to have the high priest, which is representing Hamashiach, who is our high priest. But at the Day of Atonement, you're going to pray the sins back into the scapegoat and let it go into a barren place. Do that make sense with Azazel and the Enoch as we read it earlier? Any questions or comments about any of that right there before we move forward? But Azazel, this angel, this, this goat is representing the fallen angel who brought all this sin into the world. Just to, just to try to make it make sense. Hallelujah. So verse chapter 16, verse 11 he is I was going to change tone. And Aharon shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Yah sent the bullock for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock in the sin offering, which is for himself. Right. So part of the reason we know this had to happen is because in Genesis 15, when Yah made the covenant with Abraham, which is what he's reconciling. And it says, Abraham did all his stuff and he fell asleep. Genesis 15, 17, Abraham cut up these animals and made this whole little thing. Um, if you want to read Genesis 15. For to, and Abraham was doing this so that he could make a covenant with Yah. But it said he fell asleep. As we see right here, he was tired. He was fighting away these birds that was trying to fly down on it. And they say when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham and lo and horror, great darkness fell upon him. He had a vision. Yah came and spoke to him and he told him, your children are going to be in the captivity for 100 years. I'm a judge. You're going to die to old age. I'm going to come back. But it say in verse 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down when it and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces. Abraham, Abraham, our ancestor, our patriarch of our of our of our genealogy of our ancestors. He didn't to pass through the pieces is who Yah is who when you make a covenant with somebody, you would pass through these pieces with each other. Yah didn't make the covenant with Abraham. The smoke and furnace is Yah, the burning lamp. And I think we didn't read did a did a reading about that before in here, too. The burning lamp is Hamashiach. So when Yah made the covenant with Abraham, he actually made the covenant with Hamashiach, which in a sense was Yah making the covenant with himself for Abraham because he loves Abraham and he knows the end from the beginning. And I know your people are going to break bad, Abraham, and I don't want to have to kill him. So really, I'm making a covenant with my, with my own son, who you're going to call Messiah, on your behalf. I'm making it with myself. So as we're in Leviticus 11, and Aaron shall bring the bullock for a sin offering, which is for himself. Now, Aaron is representing his family, but the correlation is I made a covenant with myself, with my son, but we won. He do everything I ever told. So I'm making a covenant with myself on Abraham's behalf. And that's why I sent him to make atonement for myself, as we just read in that Peter, I think that was the Peter of the Corinthians, 
a, a Yah was in Hamashiach making atonement for himself, for his own house as a sin offering, which was for himself. Why do I have Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 here? Something that is. Oh, the 70, the 70, the 70 weeks of seven where Daniel was given a prophecy of when uh, the Messiah was going to come to make the reconciliation for for iniquity. And that's just precepting Yasin and the Messiah to make reconciliation for himself, for our, for him, for the covenant that he made with Abraham. And that's why you hear me. Sometimes you all hear me say this in here. None of us was worthy. And this is another reason why we have to take this serious. None of us were ever worthy. The whole point of y'all saving any of us, every one of us on this call, is because he made that covenant with himself to Abraham. And he promised Abraham, I'm going to save a remnant of your people. And this is another reason why we have to take this series. You have not been saved for yourself. You've been saved because y'all said, I love Abraham. That's my friend right there. He do what I tell him. We are being blessed because of that covenant that Yah made with himself before our ancestors. Verse 12. So now it's telling you what Aaron going to do. He's going to kill this bullock for the sin offering for himself. And then what he going to do in verse 12? Make sure I don't skip nothing. Make sure I don't skip nothing. And that was also when Yah did that, he was showing that the word won't go out void. Because I told Abraham I'd do this and I sent my son to complete it because that's who I walked through the pieces with. And the picture really is, is Yah the father talking to Hamashiach, his son, and telling him, I already told you them people going to sin. You sure you want to do that? <laughs> and he like, yeah, dad, we made a promise to Abraham. That's our friend. He love you. I go die for him. And then when passing through them pieces, Yah is telling him. You're going to have to go die for him. You know that. And we see that when Hamashiach is here. Because what is he praying saying? If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But if not, I'm ready. But he know we did make this covenant. And, and even when Peter and the other ones like, we ain't going to let you die. We'll fight. We'll do this. No, my father will got to be done. Why? Because my father word don't go out void. And if anything changed this and this don't happen to me, then we make my father out to be a liar and he not. Why was Hamashiach standing on that like that? Because he made the covenant with Yah. Verse 12. And make sure I ain't forgotten nothing. Making sure I ain't forgotten nothing as we move. Okay. Leviticus 16, verse 12. Moving along. So after Aaron do these sacrifices, he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Yah and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small and bring it within the veil. So after Aaron do this, he's going to take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar. Excuse me. With his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yah within the veil. That the cloud of the incense, so the smell, the sin of these incense is going to cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, which is the throne of Yah. Remember, the mercy seat is the seat that sits on the Ark of the Covenant. It's the earthly representation of the throne of Yah. And he doing that, that he died not. And he shall take, no, I'll stop right there. So these incense, why is this important? Why did he have Aaron do this? Remember, Yah, is, is, Yah never asks us to do nothing that he won't do for us. This is why he's telling us y'all got to get the best of y'all to me because I sent my son, which is the best of my creation, to die for you. Y'all never asked us these days that he's had. And this is why this is important. Because, you know, some people are like, I, ain't, I can't go without eating for a day, which is, you know, to each his own. But that's that's not really the stretch. I mean, growing up poor like I did, there's been many a days I had to go without eating. <laughs> and not by choice, but... You still got some people who like, ain't no way I'm not eating for a day. <laughs> and what Yah is trying to say is, that's all I'm asking you to do. I had to sit and watch my son die for you who wasn't even worthy. As my atonement. 
Y'all keep these days just like we keep these days. He keeps it different than us because he keeps it in a spiritual manner. But, and this is why the holidays, so-called holidays or feast days of y'all are important. Because through tradition, we've been given feast days that don't got nothing to do with y'all. They say they post to. Easter is supposed to represent the resurrection. But when you read about Passover and atonement and all of that, it ain't got nothing to do with that. Christmas is supposed to be his birthday, but when you get to talk about Santa Claus and trees and gifts, it ain't got nothing to do with God, as they say. But it's 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 taught as if it does, but it don't. If you study the history of it, it don't. But when you keep the feast days of Yah, they got everything to do with Yah. And in keeping other feasts, that's offering strange fire, because that ain't about me. And when you do the history of it, it traces back to Ashtaroth and Nimrod and sun gods. And But you've been taught it's about me. Nah, that's a strange fire you offer and claiming you're doing my work in those names. And when you, when, you, when you celebrate them days, whether we know it or not, which is sad, we celebrating the entity that it's about. And y'all like, no. So this sensor full of burning coals that he telling them to take in these incense. And he like, when you let it burn, take it in the Holy of Holy. You let this sensor with these burning coals burn on them incense to let that fragrance and that cloud cover the mercy seat. Why? Why, y'all? Why you want them to do that? And it takes us to Revelation 8. And I think I'd have read this here with y'all before as well. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. It says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of an half an hour, which that's not a half an hour like we know. A half an hour in heaven might be 200 years. <laughs> I'm, I'm just speaking respectfully, but we know a day with Yah is a thousand years. So a half an hour probably wouldn't be 200, but it might be 20 years. You never know. It ain't just 30 minutes, though. This silence, we may be right now. I ain't saying we are, but we may be at this point. This silence might be going on for the last 20 years. We never know. Verse two, and I saw the seven angels which stood before Yah, and to them were given seven trumpets. We were talking about trumpets, I believe, either last week or a couple weeks before. Verse three, Revelation eight, and another angel came and did what? He stood at the altar having a golden censer. What he was doing with that censer? And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before Yah out of the angel's hand. And, he, and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. Did that make sense what he was doing right here? So when he tell Aaron, after you, after you cleanse yourself with this bullet, you're going to take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before Yah. Of Yah's fire. Remember, Yah sent the fire down from heaven to light this fire. If I'm not mistaken earlier Leviticus he said they didn't like this fire Yah sent his own fire to light this fire and it say his hands take these incense beat them small bring them in the veil in the in in in, in the censer full of fire and put the incense upon the fire before Yah that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat why because just like that angel remember Everything is the same. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Y'all meant that. Remember, none of the word to go out void. Y'all meant that. <laughs> Y'all gonna handle it just like this. So Aaron, after you do that and you come into here on this day of atonement, when you bring these answers, it's representing the prayers of the saints. The prayers of those who are actively seeking me. Not saints how they talk about at church. Remember at church today, everybody is saying. <laughs> no that ain't what saint me everybody just cause you in the building you not a saint y'all the saints why because you trying to learn the truth of Yah to apply it to your life and to follow him in spirit and truth and righteousness and justice 
in long suffering, in forgiveness, and all of those things that represent that. See, that's a saint. Somebody who really actively searching for the truth about Yah, not the strange fire. Not the strange fire. So these incense represent the prayers of us. And in heaven, the angel has a censer and they burn it and it's a sweet fragrance. And what y'all trying to say is when, when, let me look at this thing. Let me look at this thing. Aura, for example, when you pray, that's a sweet smelling incense in the throne room of y'all. This is why we have to humble ourselves before we go into the throne room of y'all. Because when you pray spiritually, that's what you're doing. And what Yah is trying to say is when you or when 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 Tiff and Shelly, when 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 Yahusha, when Octoni, when you pray, those incense is like a sweet smelling savior, savor in the throne room of Yah. And Yah is delighted in the prayers of the saints. Do that make any sense? Did that make sense to y'all what I just said? Yep. A lot of incense is coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is why he told Aaron to take the incense into the veil. This is representing the prayers when they come into the Shemaim. It's a sweet smell. Yah loves the incense. He loves the prayers of the saints. Because to be a prayer of the saint, that means you're doing what I told you to do. You can ask me anything. That's what Hamashiach said. To the, man, ask anything in my name, but it's only going to work if you're doing what I told you to do. What y'all told you to do. You have to have that level of faith too. So this is what Aaron is representing. But who is the one? The ram, the ascending offering. Hamashiach is the one in heaven that's in there interceding. So when these prayers come in like this sweet incense to Yah, Hamashiach standing right there is the role Aaron praying, bringing the prayers up there. That's Hamashiach in there interceding on the, our behalf. So on the Day of Atonement, when we afflicting our soul and meditating and praying, what he's trying to tell us is, while you doing that, Hamashiach standing right here in heaven interceding on your behalf. Do that make sense? Why that's important to y'all? Hallelujah. 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 Hamashiach up in here. Is, that's what y'all trying to say, like, boy. I done sent my son. He didn't die for you. You was not worthy. That's why we got to stay humble. Don't get cocky because you was never worthy. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, you was never worthy. Your, your father was worthy. I'm saving you on his behalf. We seen that with Lot. When y'all went to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he told Abraham, we finna go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He ain't say nothing about saving Lot. Abraham interceded right there to Hamashiach in person. Man, Lot down there is family. If it's this many righteous, this many, this many, man, look, at the end, he was just like, look, if Lot in his house righteous, say them. Hamashiach, which is the angel that, in that passage, it said that Abraham saw God in the form of a man. Who is God in the form of a man? That's the Messiah. He is the visible representation of the invisible Elohim. And as we just read in Corinthians, Yah is in him, reconciling the world back to himself. Abraham, like, just saved Lot and his family if they do it right. And Hamashiach told him, all right, they're going to be cool. Lot wasn't worthy. No, Lot, was, Lot wasn't worthy. He was saved because of his uncle. Abraham, only his uncle. But Abraham, our father, it's the same difference. It's not about us. This is why we stay humble. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 say, who is he that condemned? Who is he that condemned people? It is the Messiah that died, yeah, or rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of Yah, who also make of intercession for us. And that's the representation of Aaron in here with this censer, with these incense and this sweet smell. And Yah said, let the smell, let the smell be a cloud upon the mercy seat. Because it's representing the same smell that's in the Shemaim when the prayers of the, of the saints is up here. And I'm in here. And the Messiah is interceding on your behalf. Leviticus 16, 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yah 
that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he died not. Yeah, let it be right here. Verse 14, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock. So the bullock who he killed for himself, the blood of the Messiah, he gonna take it and sprinkle it with his finger up on the mercy seat, eastward. This word eastward is important. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times, seven representing com completion. So we know Aaron had to do this blood this bullock so that he could be claimed to go into the into the uh, Holy of Holies or the throne room of Yah. Eastward right here means the word for eastward is Kadma or Kadim. And we went over this word east to an Israelite as now we in the West, America. And they always talk about Western democracy and the Westernized thinking. And the West really fake runs the world, at least that's how they try to play it. But the East represents the ancient path, the eternal path, the path of Yah. So why is he putting it up on the mercy seat eastward? Because he's trying to tell us that. He's trying to tell us that. The blood eastward is telling us that. To focus on the mark. To focus on the ancient path of Yah. The blood of the Messiah should cause you to be focusing on the ancient path of Yah. If you're covered in that blood. If you're living in those ways. Yeah. He's also telling us that we have to be focused on the ways of the Messiah. for To be counted as the righteous. For our prayers to be brought into the throne room of Yah. We have to be focused on the ways of the Messiah, who is the earthly representation of the Elohim. We have to be focused on the ancient path. And this is how you get your prayers brought into the throne room of Yah. The reason I know that is because Proverbs chapter 28, I think it's verse four. I haven't read this in a while. Where is it? Oh, it's verse nine. He that turneth away his, his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. You can't be living any old kind of way and just praying, thinking, Yah, hearing you. No. You got to be focused on Yah's ancient path. You got to be focused on doing the word and the being a part of the ways of Yah. And then, this is why it's a sweet savor, because when you focused on that and you praying, Yah like Yah delights to hear from you. Know that when you pray, Yah delights to hear from you. <laughs> then shall he kill the goat of the sin offer. Remember, this is for the people. That is, that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil. Remember, the life is in the blood. To a Hebrew, that's why you don't drink or eat blood, because the life of a thing is in his blood. So he said, when you kill this goat, bring his blood within the veil and do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it up on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Why? Because y'all's like, the goat is representing us killing our pride. And when we kill our pride, atone, humble ourselves, repent, reflect on y'all, and we destroy our pride, like I say, he's like, then the blood or your life, the best part of you, can come before the throne. See, it's all representing, and I know my eye kept saying this earlier, it's about getting your heart right. It's the same difference. We have to give our best. We have to get our hearts right. We have to give our life. After we repent and make atonement to stay in the house, we have to give our life to Yah. Give your life out. That don't necessarily mean you got to die, but that means you have to sit certain things down and start spending more time with Yah. Make an effort to keep his Shabbat. That's important. Make an effort to keep Yah Shabbat. That is important. You know why? Because although it's, it's to Yah, that's you showing the effort that I'm trying to give as much to you as I can, Yah. That's where the blessing is at. We have to give our life to follow. And we see you sprinkling it on the mercy seat after the blood of the bullock because we're showing that we're going to give our life to following, to live like the Messiah who 
has done all these things in the same manner um, with Yah, so to speak. Hallelujah. Verse 16, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place. So now he also got to atone for the holy place. Really? Really, y'all, you making him atone for the holy place? Yeah, he do. Why? Because of the uncleanness of the children of Yasharal and because of their transgression and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation. He got to do that. Y'all like, yeah, he got to make atonement for the holy place because of the sins of Israel. So shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remain among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Really? Y'all like, yeah, that got to be done. Verse 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation. Really? No man can come in when he make an atonement for the holy place. Until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Yasharal. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before Yah and make an atonement for it and shall take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it up on the horns of the altar round about. So and then we make an atonement inside and out. But this atonement for the holy place though. There is no temple no more. So what is the temple? 2 Corinthians 6.16 Well, how do you make atonement for the holy place, y'all? There is no more temple. How do we do that? What is the correlation? And he told us in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, and what agreement hath the temple of Yah with idols? Ain't no idols in the temple of Yah. We ain't following no other gods. We ain't celebrating them on their holidays. None of that. Ain't no none of that. There is no agreement with it. I know, you know, as we come into the truth, we battle. I understand it's a natural process. All of, I bet everybody in here got a story of, being in the troop, going through their first holiday season, their first Christmas, their first Thanksgiving, their first Halloween. It's a battle. It's a battle. <laughs> it's, um, it's a worthy battle, but it's a battle. But know at the end of that, as you just continue to pray and meditate and ask Yah to show you the way, there is no agreement with the temple of Yah and with idols. Keep that in your mind as you battle. You do you fighting a worthy fight. For you are. Ain't no more temple. Y'all like, you don't need no temple. You don't need no physical building. Remember, I didn't even want that physical building. Remember, y'all did not want a temple. He told King David at first, no, I don't want that. I want people to know they can worship me wherever. David begged him, y'all, but you this, you that. We taking all these nations. They got temples to these fake gods. We should have at least a temple to the real Elohim. He said, well, look, David, you fighting too much, man. People scared of you, man. You can't build it because if you build it, then people going to say that great warrior of Israel built that temple and going to be scared to come to it. No, Solomon got to build it. I'm going to make it peaceful in his time. But you don't need that temple. Why? Because y'all say right here, you are the temple of the living Elohim. As Elohim have said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. So in Leviticus 6.16, 6, in Leviticus 6.16, 6, what he's telling him about making atonement for the holy place, what he's telling us is, is we got to cleanse our temple. Why? So Yah can dwell within us. This is all a part of atonement. This is the point of the day of atonement. It's more than just not eating or drinking for the 24 hours. This is the work that Yah is trying to do in us. He's trying to do in you and me. This is, this is what he's trying to tell us about atoning, about the reconciliation. I'm reconciling the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. I got to clean your temple. Why? So that I could dwell within you. As he says, that remain among them in the midst of them, of their uncleanness. You got to clean. On this day of atonement, we got to work on cleaning up your temple. And we all got to work on cleaning up our temple better. That's a work you're going to be working on until the end of your life. 
But that's what he's trying to tell us. I got to clean y'all temple. We know it ain't about the building today because ain't no building today. So we're the temple. He told us in 2 Corinthians, you the temple. The temple within you. And the reason why my son had to come make atonement, because that's the starting of the cleansing of your temple, so I can come back and dwell within you. That's the reestablishing of the connection. Verse 18. We're coming to the end. And the reason why he said, can't no man be in the temple while he do it? Because of Mashiach, who died and who ascended up here, who in the heavens doing it on your behalf? Ain't no man up here. Ain't no man in the temple up here. Enoch was translated, but we read it talks about Enoch being changed into an angel. Enoch ain't a man. Nobody walks around in the Shemaim looking like a man in flesh and blood. The only person we know on record who did that is in the book of Enoch when he had a vision of heaven. He asked the angel, like, who is that one looking like a man walking with the ancient of days? And he told him, that's your Messiah. That's the only that's the only entity that can go up there looking like that in that form. Everybody else got to be in a spiritual form. So he's telling us, ain't no man. Ain't no man up here. This reconciliation is a spiritual thing. This reconciliation is a spiritual thing. Verse 18 and 19. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before Yah and make an atonement for it. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and the bull of the goat and put it up on the horns of the altar. We got to give our life just like the bull gave his life for the true atonement. And how do we do that? We got to be like the bull. And he shall sprinkle the blood up on it with his finger seven times. Just represent completion. You got to be complete in this. Hold and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. He like this. This process, man. <laughs> Y'all like, look, this process, man, y'all got to get this right. The blood of Hamashiach, it cleanses us. It cleanses everything. It's what cleanses. It's what reconciles us. It's what brings us back into the, uh, it's, it's what reestablished the connection. It's why we're here today. You're like, yeah, y'all got to be cleansed, man. The altar, remember, that's where the prayers are. It got to be clean. All of this had to be reconciled for the prayers to be heard from Yah. Hallelujah. I know in Hebrews chapter 9, I think it's a verse 22. I wrote here, it talks about, uh, it says, Nine verse twenty two, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding the blood, there is no remission. That's why we needed a Mashiach, and it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these. Remember when he first told Moses and them to build the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle, he said, "I'm gonna y'all pattern this after a pattern in heaven, and you needed the blood to purify it." But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. But spiritually, a true spiritual cleaning, you need a better sacrifice than bulls and rams. You're going to need the blood of the lamb, the heavenly, the spiritual lamb, the Messiah. For the Messiah is not entered, is not entered into the holy place made with hands. Now, it ain't just about these buildings. It's about the Shemaim, but it's about your heart. Remember, the holy of holies of a man is his heart. That's the seat of authority in his life. That's where he thinks from. That's where he understands from. You have to accept this into your heart, which are the figures of the true. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Elohim for us. The Messiah, he has not entered into the holy place made with hands. He entered into your heart. He's entered into heaven. Remember, Yah creates man. Like we birth children, but we don't create them. Yah creates man. Yah sends that child to you, <laughs> to that woman. You don't just create it. And now science is what? You got different programs. You can go pick the color of hair, the eyes. That ain't Yah. No, I create man. That's a holy place made without hands. 
That's the temple. Verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often. As the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood, he's talking about the day of atonement. The high priest had to do this every year. He like the Messiah didn't have to do this often. Why? But then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, and just think, 2,000 years ago, Paul and them were saying it was the last days. We saying that now, people looking at us crazy. Paul and the disciples were saying it was the last days, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> they was already like, this is the end of the world. Once at the end of the world, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Why? Because Yah was in him. That was the reconciliation. So as you see, the, the, the sacrifice of animals could only go so far. It was only by the blood of the lamb could we be completely made pure for Yah. Hallelujah. Verse 20, we're coming to the end. And when he have made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. He shall bring the live goat. Get his go go again. Is this what I'm looking for with this goat? No. So now it's back to the goats. Now, this remember the, the other goat been sacrificed for Yah. That's us humbling ourselves, sacrificing our pride and repenting. This the live goat. This is Azazel again, the scapegoat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Yasharal. See what I said? As Azazel, we read in Enoch, he taught the world this sin, how to war, how to do all this other stuff. The scapegoat, which in Hebrew means name is Azazel. Aaron will lay his hands on this goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Yasharal and all their transgressions and all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man, fit meaning timely, a ready man, into the wilderness. He like he gonna be sent away. He got to be sent away. Where? Let me see. Do I say here? No, not yet. Oh, yes, I do. He shall lay both his hands No, not yet. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities. Why? Because Azazel was the one who taught him. Unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let the goat let go the goat in the wilderness. Land. The word here for land, now rest, is to be firm, the earth, country, wilderness, a world. Just follow me and say a world. He shall be led unto a land or a world not inhabited. Gezara, a desert, somewhere separated. Really? Y'all like, yeah, really? He shall be let go. The precept for this is Matthew 25. Another thing this let me know is this is why we have to know the Bible, because part of the reason why people tell you the Old Testament done away with and they fumble over the New Testament is because they don't know the Old Testament. And as we've been bouncing back and forth, as you see, the Old Testament and the New Testament, what they call is really one testament. But just for sake, for sake of saying, it all flows together. This is part of the stumbling of our people. Because we've been taught the Old Testament done away with it. So we trying to fit the New Testament into a box of understanding that we didn't got passed down, not understanding that all you got to do is read the Old Testament and it explains it. The two Testaments explain themselves. And Matthew 25 is talking about at the day of judgment. And it says, Yah is going to put, as you see, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Matthew 25, what am I looking for? Is it 30? Or in Matthew 20, 25, 33, he shall set the sheep on his left hand, the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And what are you going to do with the goats? 
Then shall he say unto them, unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, you ones with the sin, into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. The lake of fire was never even prepared for man. Man is going to go in it because we've bowed down to the teachings of the devil and his angels. Letting you know that it's a plurality of wickedness, right? So this scapegoat, when he's telling them it's going to go into this wilderness and this barren place, this world, this set apart barren world, this desert, Yah's trying to let them know right there. Azazel, who taught this sin, is one of the angels of, of the devil because he isn't the head one, at least I don't believe he is. But him also, with y'all who go into the teachings of these goats, you're going to go into this barren world, this wilderness. You go into the lake of fire, is what he's telling Aaron. That's the correlation he's making there. And, and mind you, keep in mind as we read all this, the Day of Atonement is Tuesday at sundown to Wednesday at sundown, right? I'm just trying to bring light to it's not just about not eating. Yah has been using all of this to make his examples to show us this is how it's going to go. So when you do this, it's not just about not eating. It's about humbling ourselves to the will and the word of Yah and understanding that it's actually a blessing that Yah has showed you to keep this. Why? Because he's trying to let you know you don't want to be the goat. Think about that. We call everything the goat. And Yah is trying to let us know you really don't want to be the goat. I used to be like that watching sports. Everything was the goat. And when y'all showed me this, I had to humble myself like, I ain't no goat. I skipped the precept. Second Corinthians 3.3. 3. With the reconciling of the holy place. I skipped this. When y'all was reconciling the holy place, it says in 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistles of y'all, and just think we are it's all about manifesting today. But in the word of Yah, manifest means to render apparent, to declare. And this is the only thing I'm manifesting. I hear people talk about manifesting all these things, and that's what's up with them. The only thing I'm manifesting is what he say right here. Is manifestly declared, or it's been rendered apparent, it's been brought forth, it's been showed to self to be the epistle of the Messiah. Epistle meaning a message, a written message. That's it. Our lives is the message of the Messiah. That's the only thing I'm manifesting. I manifest, if I can, y'all, that you show us how to be the messengers of the Messiah. Ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living Elohim, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And that's part of the reconciling of the holy place. As he is cleansing our temples, which is the temple of Yah, we have to we have to accept and allow Yah to write His laws, um, the message of the Messiah on our heart. Like I said, because the heart is the holy of holy of men. It's the it's 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 the it's the seat of authority, and the man is in his heart. Hallelujah. And after all this, verse twenty three, it says, "What we got here?" And Aharon shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments, which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. So when he come out the holy place, you got to take the garments off. Don't go get them dirty. Now, mind you, the spiritual garments, we can't get dirty. But he trying to tell him these garments is to come into the throne. We trying to get spiritual holy garments to come into the throne room. Literally. Hallelujah. And he shall wash his flesh with water. He got to cleanse himself after all of this. Dealing with all his sin and all that. He got to go get back grounded in the word. That's what y'all telling us of ourselves. And put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. So after we do all the sin offering, then we make the, the ascending offering of the ram representing we are giving our spirit to Yah. We are trying to ascend into the heavens and give our spirits to the most high Yah. And the fat of the sin offering, fat represents, as you see, the fat is the richest or choice part. The best of a, the best of the sin offering shall he burn up on the altar, representing 
that not only do we repent and turn from our ways as we make atonement, we have to dedicate ourselves to giving the best parts of ourselves to Yah. Not just what we want, not just however, you know, not just whatever, whenever, however, but we got to give our best to Yah. Verse 26, and he that let go the goat for the scapegoat, and he that let go, the timely man, the ready man, which is what um, a fit man means, he shall wash his clothes and bathe his feet and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward come into the camp. You got to be made back clean before you come back into the house of Yah when dealing with these this wickedness. Go to show you that wickedness will leave a stench. And Yah, like, you got to be made clean. But what he's showing is, is even in sin, if you wash your clothes and bathe your flesh in water, if you become immersed in the word, as Ma'aki came to be saying, you immerse yourself in the word, you could come back in the camp even after dealing closely with sin. But you got to humble yourself to do it. You got to make atonement. And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth outside the camp and shall burn in the fire their skins and their flesh and their dung. Meaning the, the, the physical things we got to take. Those got to be left outside the camp of Yah because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom. And he that burned them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh. You got to get back clean. And afterward, he could come back into the camp too. And with those last verses, Yaj is trying to say that when you outside the camp, which we've been, most of us probably have been at a time, if we humble ourselves and get back right with y'all, you could come back inside the camp. And coming back inside the camp is representing, coming back inside the camp is representing coming back. Coming back inside the camp is representing us getting back into the house of Yah or the kingdom of Yah. Before I go into verse 29, um, Shelly, would you like to break down a word? Or is there any questions or comments about any of that with atonement before we move to that? It's on you, Shelly, if you want to break down the word. Okay. So first, um, can you read 29 for me? Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29 says, And this shall be a statue forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country, meaning an Israelite, or a stranger that's sojourning among you. So anybody who claiming to be walking in the ways of Yah, whether he a blood-born Israelite or a Gentile who clinging on to the Israelites in the ways of Yah, all of you have to do this. Hallelujah. Okay. All right. So the word that I um, chose to break down is the word um, for afflict. Um, the Hebrew word for that is, the, the root is anah. It's strong 1631. So anah um, means, obviously, to, in English, to afflict or to humble. Um, also could mean to oppress. Um, so when, you, when we read that script, it doesn't specifically say in that script to fast, to, um, to you know, to, to not drink water, not to eat. Right. So where do we get that from from it? It kind of gets unlocked in the word. So afflict, when you think of the word afflict you, in English, at least for me, when I, I, I think of it, it gives off like a negative meaning, like to cause pain or to do something bad. Like if I afflict you, that to me in English has a negative conversation. But in Hebrew, that's not necessarily the case. Um, there is in some regards where it is used like that, but in this case, it's not. It in this case is referring to humbling oneself, but not only just humbling oneself, humbling oneself until to the lowest point, to the most your most humblest of humblest positions. So, what is the difference between humble in the sense of affliction 
as opposed to humbling how we're supposed to humble ourselves every day, right? What is the difference that they're speaking of that we need to do on Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement? So to really break down um, the word, you have to kind of go into the, the cultural meaning of words. So ancient Hebrew people were agricultural people. So Hebrew words, a lot of times were based off of agricultural concepts. So it's important to understand that and picture that um, to understand the biblical or spiritual meaning of words as well. So you have to kind of see the word as the, the, the writers of the Bible would have seen it. So the word ana um, is also used to mean to plow. And so if anybody's seen like a farmer when he plows, uh, the plowing is when you make that um, hole in the ground, right? Uh, so that you can put the seeds in. And so the word ana is really referring to the hole itself, that hole in the ground or that depression. So I want you to keep that in mind, that hole in the ground. So kind of going back to the English definition, humble. What is humbling? Humbling is bringing yourself to your lowest point, right? A position of humbling is bowing, right? So in the case of a nah, though, you want to go, to, you want to humble yourself to your lowest point. So bowing is not good enough. You want to humble yourself to your so low, you're picturing yourself in that hole in the ground. You're not even laying at the feet of of the, of the throne you're in a hole in the ground because you're going to bring yourself so low so with afflicting your soul you're humbling yourself where your flesh is non-existent you're bringing that flesh down to its lowest point so denying yourself of your fleshly needs or desires and one of those fresh fleshly needs and desires is eating and drinking because the point of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is to not focus anything on the flesh, but to, to, to uh, focus solely on the soul, on the spirit, and that the needs and desires of your spirit. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I got more. I got more. But is that, does that, what I said, make sense as far as and not and afflicting and the difference between that and just humbling yourself on a daily. True. Perfect sense. Okay. So now we're going to go into the um, actual Hebrew letters. So Ana is spelled Ein Nun Hey. So I, so again, we want to put your picture again, the farmer. Right. So you always want to picture an agricultural person, how agricultural person would look at this word. So ein is the eye. It means to watch. Uh, noon is the seed. And then hay is to behold or play, pay close attention to something. So when a farmer plows or a farmer plants his crops, he's going to watch over his crops. Right. He's going to make sure that there's no infestations. He's going to make sure that there's no wild animals eating his crops. He's going to make sure that he weeds out, you know, weeds that may be strangling his crops. So he's going to continuously watch over his seed. He's paying close attention to his seed. That's the picture of the father. The father is watching over his humbled ones, the ones who afflict themselves, the ones who bring themselves to their, the most humblest points. He is continuously watching that seed and paying close attention to the seeds, to his humbled ones. Hallelujah. Any questions? Hallelujah, that was a great, great breakdown. Thank you. That was a good breakdown. This rep is showing the father watching over his seed closely, his humble ones. That's what you came with? Yes. Yes. He's he's continuously watching over his humbled ones, the ones who have brought themselves to the lowest before him. 
Well, hallelujah. That was a good breakdown. And that, that, that just further shows why when we keep the feast days of the father, the importance of it. Because it's showing that we, it's, it's part of showing that we are humbling ourselves up under the will of the father. And that is something that you work on every day. But on this particular day, um, for lack of a better word, he's keeping a close watch to see who really, who really going above and beyond to the best of their ability as well. Anything anybody want to add or any questions to that before we move on and finish the chapter? We at the end. Great breakdown, um, Shelly. Reading Leviticus 16, verse 29, one more time. And this shall be a statue for forever. And this shall be a statue forever unto you. Um, which also goes against how we how, they, how in tradition these holidays have been taught like these holidays been done away with. That ain't what Yah said. Yah said, this shall be a statue forever unto you. That in the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that's sort of joined among you. For on that day shall the priest make atonement for you to cleanse you that you be that you may be clean from all your sins before Yah. And we know that spiritually this high priest is a Mashiach. He died to make that atonement, to reconcile us, to cleanse of us our sins, to give us the opportunity to be made clean. From all our sins before Yah. It shall be a Shabbat of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statue forever. Don't let nobody tell you that these things have been done away with. We ain't hearing that. And the priest, whom he shall anoint, and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office, in his father's stead, Yah anointed the Messiah. Yah made consecrated him to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead. He is the earthly representation of the invisible Elohim. He shall make atonement and shall put on the linen clothes, even the set apart of Kodesh garments. And he shall make an atonement for the Kodesh or set apart sanctuary. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priest the chosen ones, the servants of Yah, and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you. Through the, recon through the reconciliation of the Messiah, this shall, it, it, it's going to lead, if you, if you follow it, if you humble yourself, as my Isha just said, it will lead you to everlasting life, to make an atonement for the children of Yasharal, for all their sins once a year. And he did as Yahuwah commanded Moshe. Aharon did this. Same as the Messiah, he did this. So keep in mind as we are afflicting ourselves and humbling ourselves. As I said earlier. The Messiah was is interceding on our behalf in the Shemaim all the time, but especially at this time. All the time, but especially at this time. And just take this serious to humble yourself before our Elohim to show him that. And he know that we work. And like I heard my ox say earlier, we in Babylon. He know you in captivity. And it's, it's, you know, things are, some things may be tougher to do. It's not about necessarily even doing this to the letter naturally because you ain't have a temple. You ain't sacrificing these animals. But it's about showing Yah that you're willing to give your all, your best effort, and to dedicate your life into learning his ways and getting as close to it all as you can. And that's what the Day of Atonement is about. Hallelujah, that's the end. Any questions or comments about any of this as we bring it to an end? No, nah, just just great, great discussion. Ak, as always, great lesson. Um, nah, nothing really to add. Ak. 
I appreciate your uh your your breakdown. Hallelujah. I, I appreciated yours earlier. Now you helped me get some things in order. I was lacking. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everybody good on today before we leave. And remember that, uh, like I say, Tuesday, at least that's the day where it fell for us. I know that the days fall different. Don't mind that. I know that sometimes the days fall different. Do not mind that. But um, that's when we'll be keeping it. Tuesday at sundown to Wednesday at sundown. Uh, anybody who want to partake with us, and I know some of, uh, some of you already are on that schedule, but if anybody want to partake with us, um, Tuesday at sundown, we're going to, you know, you know, and you know, we're going to just drink plenty of water throughout the day, um, as we all should be doing anyway. Um, get your last meal if you're able sometime before sundown, and you can make it. Once you make it through the night, it's all good. I, in traditional times, I found when I did this before that getting through the night was the harder part. And then when I woke up in the morning, I was good. But with that being said, something that comforts me is I'm going to spend it as a day of read. Um, and a lot of times, like they say, time flies when you're having fun. When I'm reading the, the scriptures and doing it, it just say, for one, I never get hungry doing that because I'm spiritually being fed. And the time just moves along for me like that. So, um, one of you may say, I'm just going to spend the time out in the park with the kids. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You know what I'm saying? But just set aside some time to try to humble yourself for y'all because as we read today, and I pray that, um, I will pray that. Uh, we just illuminated the importance of this spiritually and how Yah has given, he's He's gave his bullock, he's sacrificed for the atonement and, and that's him giving us his best. So, you know, let's stay focused on giving our best as well. Shabbat shalom, mama. It's good to see you today. I'm glad you enjoy. Anything anybody want to add? Go ahead. Um, I did. Uh, shalom, everybody. I want to say, first of all, how blessed I am by this reading as I am by all of them. But um, I often reflect on the wedding feast spoken of, and I think it's Matthew 22, uh -huh. um, specifically the part where it talks about the man who was found to be basically um, they said he was dressed in the wrong garments and therefore he was cast out into outer darkness. Um, so it always causes like a bit of anxiety with me when I think about it, because I don't want to be found unacceptable. So when you said earlier that uh, Yah gives the garments, I realized that um, it's Yah when he sends the invitation to the wedding, basically. And we basically RSVP and we say that we'd be honored to share in it. Um, he then begins the work of changing our garments for us. So it's through obedience. This is what I realized today. And you could correct me if I'm off a little bit. But I believe that it's through our obedience to Messiah that we are changed and transformed. Um, so the one who was found unacceptable in Matthew 22 is the one who basically tries to sneak in unaware or the one who did not enter through the door of Messiah. Um, so that's the one who has not cha been changed um, and has not been made acceptable or arrayed in the proper garments that Yah has chosen. At least that's how I feel. So um, after you said that, and then I reflected again on that scripture, I received like a little bit of comfort because I realized that it's not we definitely have to be working out our salvation with fear and trembling. But if we are obedient to Yah through his son, he will change us and put us in the proper garments. And so we won't have to fear being bound and cast out into outer darkness. So anyway, I was just really blessed by that. I just wanted to add that. Shalom. Shalom. And the scripture she's talking about is Matthew 22. Um, Uh, the Messiah, it's the Messiah it says, and Yahushua answered and spake unto them again by parable and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. 
Now we know the king to be Yah in this instance, and the marriage he's making is his son, is the Messiah. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidding or called to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are which who, who those who've been called and chosen, Israel, behold, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. They didn't take it serious. And they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. They chose the ways of the world, money, celebrity, things that happen now over the wedding feast. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. They even killed some of the servants. Man, don't come over here talking about that. We don't want to hear that, which we know that in the Bible, the prophets. A lot of them were killed for going to tell people what Yah was telling them about getting right with him. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. That's how we got here in the captivity today. Hallelujah. Then said he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were called were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid the marriage. The last servants, he said, when you go out, this is us. When you go out with this word, you go to the lost sheep of Israel. But whoever amongst them are interested in the wedding and they want to come, invite them. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both good and bad. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Don't, hey, don't worry about how nobody living, because like the Ecosi just said, I'm the one going to change the garments. And let that be a note. We never know what y'all done put on somebody's heart. That's why we got to be in the right temperament to go out with this word. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man. And this is what the part that Kochi was just talking about. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man which had not which which had not on a wedding garment. He went he didn't have on the holy garments. And he said unto him, friend, how came his thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Why? Because he knew he was an Israelite. I'm, oh, I'm awakened Israelite. I keep the feast. I know the Shabbat. But he hadn't been changed in his heart. He was the same. He was trying to come to the feast being the same. And that's the message to what we own today. When we catch so many people, and I always say this, just because a person tell you they know they're Israelite, that don't mean nothing. Just because he could explain these feasts and all of that, that's just the beginning. His fruits are representing. Where's heart at? Is he a backbiter? Do we got respect to persons? Is he a man worshiper? See, those are the type of things that keep you out of the garments. Yeah, you may know about the feast and the servants and I believe in the Messiah and yeah, all this other in speech, but in practice. Has your garments been changed? Has you changed? Have you changed from your ways? Have you got your speech in order? And that's why this is always a process because um, we build it towards that. But you got a lot of people amongst this awakening who know they Israelites who be out of order in a multitude of ways. But you will only know they out of order if you know your Bible. That's why you got to read it. And that's what this man with these messed up garments is. He an Israelite who claimed to know he an Israelite and he know this and that about Yah and blah, 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 blah. Yet he still got envy and jealousy in his heart and be backbiting. You ain't got on the right garments for the wedding. And in the end, he going to be speechless. Just like Amashiach said, many going to come to me and say, in your name, we didn't did this and that. Remind you, and I, I tell y'all this every week. This is why we ain't stressing no Christians. Because when Amashiach said that, he wasn't talking about Christianity. He was talking to these Israelites <laughs> who claim that they doing this and that in his name. And he's going to be like, yeah, but you was doing it with envy and all kind of schemes in your heart. Depart from me. Verse 13, then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. That barren place with a scapegoat go. That desert. Anybody who moving like that, you going with a scapegoat going. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called. I didn't call y'all like, yeah, I didn't call a lot of y'all. As you see, I done sent servants, been sending servants since the beginning to call y'all. But it's only going to be few who chose them. 
and you are right, Akoti, as you continue to build, um, as you continue to give your all and work towards getting right with Yah, he is the one going to establish the garments. We just got to do the work, which is, and the work is simply, you know, the work may only be as simple as letting the word be present in our household and building ourselves up and cleansing our own temples, making sure that we're getting the things out of our own life and Yah is going to furnish the garments. Hallelujah. Anything else anybody want to add or comment or question anything before we go? We're coming to the end. We didn't made it to the end, actually. It's been a good read. I hope y'all enjoyed this read. I see a few of y'all in the comments say you enjoyed it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So as we humble our hearts and as we know, going into the throne room of y'all, we take that serious. <laughs> As we see, this is serious matters. As these prayers come up and they like the incense. And then we go into the throne room of Yah. We know Hamashiach is in there in the seat and on our behalf. Just picture the scene. Angels all around, there's lights and colors. The rainbow. Which Yah said when he made the covenant, he said, I'm going to sit the bow right here. He said it by the throne. We know that from Revelation because it said it was a rainbow that surrounded the throne. So keep that in your, just, just picture the moment. Yah's on the throne, the rainbow's there. And, and also remember, when you see a rainbow in the sky, that is Yah giving you a glimpse into the throne room, physically, literally. <laughs> How real is that? But just picture the throne room with the rainbow around the throne and all these angels, different, looking different. I can't even explain them all. Colorful, Hamashiach there, the Ruach HaKadosh is there. And we coming in there. And mind you, Yah, it's, it's this magnificent scene that we see in movies that's bigger than us, right? Because these movies try to depict these type of things um, in different ways. But with all of that going on, all of that magnificence going on, Yah is delighting in hearing from you. <laughs> How real is that? And this is why we humble our hearts before we go into prayer and we talk to our Elohim. Because he like, man, I'm delighting to hear from you. And we humbly come before the throne as always, Abiyah. We thank you for blessing us to see another day. We say, Toda Rabbah. We thank you for waking us up to the Shabbat and learning your ways and applying them to our life. Um, most importantly, getting our heart right, learning how to treat our brother, learning how not to backbite, not to gossip, not to lie, not to bear false witness, learning how not to be jealous or envious because you've created us all for a different purpose, but we all work towards the body. And we thank you for showing us that, Father Yah, for, for forgiving us of our sins, as you say. Our iniquity have been cleansed, but we got to walk in that. We can't just continue to sin and, 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 and assume that. And we thank you for that, Father, as we come into the throne room. We ask you to continue to be patient and merciful with us, Father, and to show the mercy that only you can, um, better than all, as I should say. And we ask you to teach us to forgive those who have wronged us and teach us to be merciful, Abiyah. And if anybody comes to us, Abiyah, who've wronged us, and they come to us humbly and they like, you know, I did wrong. And whatever the case may be, humble our hearts so that we can accept that and move forward righteously. For you only forgive those who forgive the ones who wronged us. As we humbly come into the throne room, as we bow this knee, Father, we ask that you, as we, um, the ones of us who are going into that, we ask that as we afflict our souls, Father Yah. In this coming week, on the seventh day, on the set in the seventh month, on the tenth day, and we try to make atonement for our sins, Father Yah. And as we humble ourselves in whichever matter that you put on our hearts that that needs to be done, Father Yah. We just ask that you reveal more of yourself to us, and that your ruach hakodesh is upon us and our households, and that you work with us, and that you speak to us in meditation and prayer, um, and study, always, but especially on that day so that we can better ourselves and to do better by you, Father, so that we can grow in your truth, so that you can help us to establish your truth in our household with our children and amongst anybody amongst us who, who want to hear, whether it be our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, 
whomever you put in front of us, Abiyah, give us the right temperament, guide the words and the speech that come out of our mouths, Abiyah, so that we can be functioning vessels, good vessels, hopefully one day in your tabernacle, that we can put on the holy garments like Aharon, as you've promised us that. If we do right at the last trumpet, it said when the Messiah comes, we'll be changed. He's going to give us those holy garments so that we can come into the kingdom of Yah. We pray that you help us to share more of our fleshly, worldly ways, Father Yah, every day. And to focus more on, your, on the spiritual matters, more on the Torah, more on the heavenly things, and more on to doing not what the world say is good, not what the world say is profitable, not what the world say is our purpose. We don't want to manifest nothing of the world. But we want to do everything to your glory. Because we understand that is the only glory that matters. And we care nothing about the glory of men. I pray for a Coty Tiffany, Father Yash, she had to go to work. Um that you continue to work on her and her family, that you cleanse her temple and help her to get healthy. She says she's been a little congested. Uh, and we just pray, Father Yah, being that you are all knowing and have the keys to everything, Father Yah, that you send your Ruach, which is the breath of life into her lungs and into her temple, and you cleanse her and you, and you continue to work with her to be the light that you've called her to be, that she's been trying to walk in. Hallelujah, we thankful for her. And that you guide her in all our ways and all our steps and make all our crooked paths straight. I pray that same prayer for everybody on the call. If anybody is ill or know somebody feeling ill, um, that you have mercy, Abiyah, and you let your will be done and that your glory be seen in all situations for everything about you is miraculous. Nothing about you is logical. It's spiritual. There is no logic to the spiritual. And it says that you are a spirit, a spirit, the invisible Elohim. And we thank you for that, Father Yah. We pray that anybody who was impacted by that storm that just came through Florida and or South Carolina where it's at, that you protect your chosen, Father Yah, those who earnestly seek you. And as the scriptures say, you will forgive whomever you choose. And we just ask that you fulfill that scripture, knowing that your word won't go out void. And that you help Israel and anybody who's seeking you in those areas, Father Yah. We pray that you continue to Shield us from all wickedness and let your hedge be around us and our household, Father Yah. And that by the blood of the lamb, the, the pure blood, the blood the, that reconciles us, that establishes the connection. We pray that we are worthy that these prayers come into the throne room like a sweet smelling incense. And that as you turn your face back to us and lend just your ear, um, that if we be heard by you, it is more than enough. In the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, who intercedes on our behalf, and whose name we ask all things, um, as you sent the best of your creation to die for our sins, Father Yah, continue to put it on our heart to give us your best. Thy kingdom come, thy will will be done on earth as it is in the Shemaim, and we just pray that everything we do is of your will, and that we get up under your will at every turn. In the name of the Messiah, we pray, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Hey everybody have a good day, man. I hope y'all good everywhere you at. I pray everybody family good. Endure to the end, man, and stay strong. It's hectic out here, but we going to make it, man. We got to trust y'all in that matter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Shalom, shalom, Ari P. I see you. Hallelujah. Uh, for those of y'all who don't know, I was on the phone <laughs> praying with somebody a couple days ago. And when I finished praying, I was like, hallelujah. And for the first time, as much as I tried to get her to say it, Ariel was in the back like, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, it tickled me. It tickled awesome, me. awesome, awesome. Praise you. She did, man. It took with the person I was on the phone with. They was like, was that Ariel? I was like, yeah, that was the first time she said hallelujah. You know how kids be. You tell them to say something, they won't say it. But she hear me say it, and she in the background talking about some hallelujah. Brought a tear to my eye. I can't lie. Everybody have a good day, though. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, family. Blessings. Same to you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, fam. Shabbat shalom, my king. Shabbat shalom.
Goodbye, Shalom. <laughs>